wound up already. I've been overwhelmed already today. And it wasn't, well, you know, know what's really hard is that the Bible says this thing is so simple that a fool couldn't err in. Right? Now, I don't believe you got to be a rocket science, cum laude, none of those things to understand this. I really believe that it's a matter of really hearing the word, reading the word, believe what the word said over what you wanted to say. Part of our study tonight, why don't you get about five or six of them? <laughs> but, uh, I, you know, I, I sometimes, sometimes I feel like, man, no matter how hard you teach this, no matter how hard you try to teach it, it's because I'm really fighting against everything there is to teach it. Because number one, it's not that I want to be different just to be different. No. I've always believed that in order to walk in God and to walk in faith, you cannot walk any deeper in God than what God has revealed to you. Right? And if you're living in the kingdom of God with no revelation, then you're going to have very little faith in what God is saying in the first place because to, it's, you know, in one place it says you walk in the light and once you don't walk in light, darkness overtake. Then, then what you're going to have, darkness is not evil, evil. Darkness really stands for a lack of understanding. That's why the Bible says in all you're getting, get an understanding. So I, I, I try, I'm trying my best to, you know, make it so that I, I know everybody's not going to be a student. Everybody is not going to go into the Word of God. And I think one of the problems we have today in church is when I got saved, you know, they told me I got saved, you're good, you're ready to go. They told me some things about supposed to help me. Stay ready, you know, stay rapture ready, all these things. And all these things sounded good to me at the time because, I mean, part of me, I, I'll be honest with you, you know why I got baptized when I got baptized? Because I woke up one Friday, it was a Friday evening, and it got real strange. I, and I, they, somebody told me, don't read the book of Revelation. Whatever you do, don't read the book of Revelation. And, of course, if you tell somebody don't, guess what they want to do? They're going to do it. So I did. I opened it up, and I got to reading, and I got seeing them dragons and stuff in there, and I, it, it shook me up so bad is that I called my pastor by 7 o'clock in the evening and told him I need to be baptized tonight. He said, you want to wait till Sunday? I said, no. I want to be ready. And so out of fear, I got baptized that night, I think it was like February uh, the 10th or something like that. I'm not sure, 6th, 10th, somewhere in there. But I got baptized because I read the book of Revelation and what it was saying was so fearful. And trying to put that together in my mind, dragons and serpents and beasts and everything else being turned loose. Well, definitely, I, I done seen the Ten Commandments. <laughs> And I didn't want to have no parts of that, so I got baptized. And of course, I came in, and the things they were teaching us at the time was the rapture. You got to be ready for the rapture. You got to be ready. Jesus is coming pretty soon. Jesus is coming real soon. And I mean, you know, this has been 40 years ago, almost. He's coming real soon. And so I even, did I tell you about that dumb thing I've done? I had had car insurance up until that point, and I got in there, they told me about the rapture. <laughs> Well, I can't, I can't list the conclusion. If he's coming back that fast, my insurance had just lapsed. I said, he's just paying his insurance. I'm going to trust in God. I had all my faith stuff all messed up. I, I'm trusting God for my car insurance. I'm trusting God a lot. And, and maybe there's nothing wrong with that, but, you know, there was something wrong with it. I didn't have a revelation to believe what I was believing, but I was believing it so hard that I was stupid with it. And I had an accident. The day my insurance went out, I had an accident, hit a car. 
Well, that kind of shook my faith up. It helped me to go back again and realize one thing, something I must have missed. You know how you, and I think a lot of stuff, people taking little pieces of this and running with it and it sounds exciting and people jump on it, say that's got to be right because that's what everybody said. I, I'm sorry. Everybody was saying it wasn't going to rain <laughs> in the days of Noah, <laughs> but it did. Uh, so I, I, I understand where we are in our thinking, and especially, you know, it's hard to embrace something so radical. And even not really hard because if you're honest with yourself, really honest with yourself, and you really believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back any moment, I mean any moment, I'm talking about like the next second, you'd have to ask yourself a question, what have I done all day? We got unsaved loved ones. And we're talking about how bad the tribulation is going to be. I mean, we're talking about, oh, you don't want to be here, man. People are going to get their head. Your kin people. Your grandbabies. Moms and dads. If that's what they're preaching is true, then if I thought Jesus was going to come back any moment, I wouldn't be even sleeping as much. Because how are you going to enjoy heaven knowing that, that you knew he was coming back and you ain't told nobody nothing? That's kind of hard for me. So I know the people that say they believe in the rapture, they really don't believe in the rapture because they started getting in debt. They started buying, doing that, doing this. <laughs> I used to hope when I got so deep in debt one time, I was praying, God, please come back. <laughs> But that's not, that's not my lesson. But I, I do feel like, you know, I, I, I can't help but preach what I preach. Not because I want to. I, I, I could make everybody shout preaching about the rapture, but that's not going to be the truth. I can't even shout on that. Because everything Jesus was going to do for you, he wanted to do for you right here. You know, I know we got some things we've read into the word of God, but we can't find it. It's like one woman told me one time, Ooh, I'm waiting for the Shekinah glory of God. I said, it's not in the Bible. You know what they said? She said, oh, yes, it is. I said, no, it's not. Isn't it funny how you keep hearing stuff and you think you heard it and you thought it was in the Bible, but it never was in the Bible. You'll never find no place in the Bible where it says his Shekinah glory. Because he don't have no Shekinah. And then, if you, and then if I ask you what is a Shekinah, you're going to tell me, well, his glory. Well, what is his glory? But Shekinah is not one of them. If you go back and study what Shekinah is, Shekinah is a goddess. And that goddess was what every Hebrew man or every Jewish man would pray for the Shekinah of God so that he can, when he went off from his wife, is that he wouldn't, he, well, anyway. I, you go back and check it out. I'm not going to get in that tonight because that's not even my lesson tonight. But I'm just trying to show us that there's so many things that has been put into the mix. It's been like wild roots, poisonous plants put into the mix of the soup and people have died from it because there's nothing about the new covenant is that will make you live in fear. That's number one. If you're living in fear, that's not the gospel. The gospel is good news, and good news ain't going to give you fear. I ain't going to get scared. They come tomorrow and tell me, man, you know, you, your uncle died, you got $40 million. You think I'm going to be living in fear? No. The gospel is good news. So it's not about scaring you to get you to love Jesus. He don't want somebody as well, you know, the only reason I go to church is because I want to be rapture ready. <laughs> That's like marrying a wife saying, the only reason why I want to stay married because I want to live in a house. <laughs> you can get your dog to live in a house. So anyway, we've been, we've been trying, I've been trying to piece this together with you, trying to help us in a lot of ways. And I know I can't quit teaching and 
this, and I'm going to be teaching probably the rest of my life, and be going over this stuff the rest of my life, because no matter how many times I say it, I know in your mind, it's like when you hear something you ain't never heard before, you know what happened is that that block goes up, that wall goes up and said, no, I can't, I can't accept that. And the reason why you can't accept a lot of things is because you've already decided that what you got is all right. But my thing is, is that if, if what they're saying is true, it should be true all the way through. You understand? If what, I, if what they're saying is true, there is principles in the Bible that laid out for you. Timeline. Uh, such as the tabernacle of Moses, the feast of the Lord, all these things is about things to be fulfilled in Christ. And so if what you believe cannot fit on that timeline, then you know it cannot be from God. You'll not find not one feast in there, not one. Especially when they teach in the, from the old covenant, the feast of the blowing of the trumpets. They told me that feast, Now I used to preach it hard, strong, and heavy. The blowing of the trumpets was that trumpet that he talked about and when the trumpet of God should sound, we're going to be caught up. The blowing of the trumpet was supposed to be the rapture. After the rapture, that's supposed to be what? Seven years of tribulation. The only problem I have with that whole teaching there is this, is that if you went back and studied the feast of the Lord, the blowing of the trumpets was 10 days and not seven. So now it already got messed up. Another problem we're going to have when you get in the book of Revelation, you're not going to find out one place in there where it ever talks about seven years. It talks about three and a half. But it never mentions no seven years. So if the tribulation, the great tribulation was seven years, like people say it is, why don't you have seven years in the book of Revelation? You don't have it. You got times and time and a half. That's three and a half years. You know why it's three and a half years? Because you go back in the book of Daniel where it says that, and the prince, he's going to call the oblation and sacrifice the seeds, and he's going to be cut off in what? The middle of the week. And so when Jesus got cut off after three and a half years, they still had three and a half more years left on the tab. Right? And that's the reason why 70 AD becomes so important. It's because the last three and a half years is the book of Revelation, that's what the part he came to totally fulfill because he had to fulfill everything that the prophets had prophesied. Moses and all of them. Moses prophesied back in Leviticus. Numbers, he prophesied some stuff about Jesus. He said, God shall raise up a prophet like unto myself. Him you shall hear. Did they do that? Not all of them. Matter of fact, when he came to talk, most of them were saying what Moses said. If they would have heard Moses, they would have knew who Jesus was. A lot of people today don't know. You know more about Moses than you know about Jesus. But anyway, that's not my lesson tonight. I'm going to try to move forward. It's in the question before I go to. I, I, you know, I, I, I love, I'm sorry. Yeah, well, see, you got 40 years. It's just like 40 years. I must call my son out of Egypt. They wanted in the desert for how long? 40 years. So the same testing that they had, Jesus came to be tested in the wilderness. Remember? The Spirit led him into where? Into the wilderness to be tested. He passed the test. And it didn't take him 40 years. You know how long it took him? 40 days. Because 40 is a time of testing. So it took Jesus, it took them 40 years, and they still didn't get the real promise, but they did get in the promised land. Jesus come, he steps into the promised land. He steps into the Jordan River. And the river doesn't roll back, but heaven's open up. Why? Because the blessing of God, heaven now is open. Open for business. When the Jews stepped into the 
Jordan River, the water rolled back, they stepped on dry land. Jesus get baptized. We see so many things out of the old covenant. The, the, the dove came and lit on Jesus. That dove represented the same dove that Noah had on his ark looking for peace. At last, a dove has found a place to rest. So, oh, it's just too much, too much tonight. Let me, let me get this here. This, this, this will help you. I, I think, number one, more than me telling you, I really want to equip you so that when I'm dead and gone, you still know what you know, not because of what I told you, but because of what you've been able to eke out yourself, know for yourself, and then you're not at everybody else's mercy when they come, try to get you all caught up in, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't. Man, you got a mark. You're going to get the mark. You're going to get the mark. Friend, you already marked already. You was marked before you was born. You was marked when you was born. So unless you believe that Jesus Christ gave you a literal mark, you can't believe in no literal mark of anything else. You can't change horses in the middle of the stream. You're not going to be able to say, that the mark of the beast is a literal mark, and then God talks about marking you more than that mark. you talking about the mark of the beast. Ezekiel said that when he went and found the people around the altar, God took an ink horn out, and he said, mark all of them. Do you believe that was a literal mark or a spiritual? Because in the book of Revelation, it says that I'm going to put my father's name in their forehead. Is that literal? No, but it goes along with what he says. Anytime he talks about the head, he's talking about the mind. Let that mind, you're marked by your thinking. Because as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Oh, Jesus, I love you so much. Mm, 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 mm. Woo. Don't ask me why, because I don't know. I just thank God that I'm dumb enough to believe. <laughs> I'm not trying to make his word say anything that it hasn't said. I'm not trying to find anything in here that's not in here. My worry, your worry, is not about somebody coming on the world scene. We done had these people preaching this ten nation, the old Roman revived empire. They had to quit preaching that because you know what? They got 13 nations instead of 10. I am tired of people telling me that the Pope is Antichrist. The Pope, Roman Catholic religion did not start till like 325, 300 AD. That was no Roman Catholic Church. Well, it was in Rome. It might have been. But the Roman Empire did not believe in the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Empire believed in men God, God man. The Caesar was, these people believed they had had their, uh, Spiritual connection. A lot of these guys are born to be God. This Romanism is not the same as Roman Catholic Church. Hmm? No, no, Romanism is, 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 is see, the, the Caesars believe they were gods. They wanted to be worshipped. That's why you've seen all their busts. They put big old busts and statues of themselves because they were supposed to be God. And they believe that their mother had something to do with some uh, Mercury or somebody that created their bloodlines, okay? So Roman Catholic Church, for someone to get up and talk about the Roman Catholic Church now as being the harlot of the book of Revelation, you, got, you, you have to really stretch your imagination to even bring that up because that's, they were not even existing when Paul, when John was prophesying, and I love what John said at the beginning. He said, John, these things that you see, don't even close the book. You know why you're going to close the book? Because they shall shortly come to pass. Now, I know first thing people want to say, well, you know what the law said. The law said, you know, a day, the law is like a thousand years. We ain't talking about a day now. He said, this shall shortly come to pass. Now, I need to go into my Bible to figure out what is shortly. But if I don't know what shortly is, why not I look for Another one's what is a long time with God? Because when he prophesied about Balaam, the false prophet, 
He made a prophecy then about the end time, but he said, but it's going to be a while. It's going to be a long time. This is not going to happen soon. So now I know God knows the difference between what's shortly and what's long. But his long time is not 2,000 years. There's no place in the Bible where God ever used the word shortly and it meant 2,000 years. Not anywhere. And even when, he, even when he prophesied about Balaam, it took 500 years, and that was a long time. So if it's 2,000 years from the book of Revelation is fulfilled and John is saying it's going to happen shortly, what, what am I supposed to believe? Well, oh, 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 Jesus, he's got to come back. No, no, no. If I believe I'm saved, I believe he's already back because if he ain't with me now, I don't know when I'm going to get him. That's the reason why a lot of people don't have faith in God because they're waiting on the God to come back. I got a God that's already here. Matter of fact, the Bible said he's going to come and set up shop, make a bold, live in us. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Who is the Holy Ghost? That's Jesus. Now, I'm, I'm stone oneness myself. I'm sorry. I only have three or four different gods. When I speak of God, I ain't got but one name for him, okay? I, I have a one name for him. I can call him the Holy Ghost, but he's still Jesus. If I call him Father, he's still Jesus. And the reason why he's Jesus is because I've been begotten by that seed. If he begot me by his seed, then he's got to be my... Hello? Oh, God. I don't want to complicate you nor confuse you, but I do believe there are certain things that you've got to have. And I, I feel so overwhelmed, not because of what I don't know. I'm overwhelmed by what I see people don't know that should know. That's what overwhelms me. And I'm not talking about loyalty. I'm talking about ministry. I'm talking about pastors and people like that. It overwhelms me because I know if you do diligent study, I, didn't, I, don't, I wasn't looking for none of this. I wasn't looking for it. It's not like I set out to go in here and say, man, I don't like what they're teaching, so I'm going to change it. No, no. But what I've done is this, that the more I explored the truth that I had, the more I explored the rapture and found out that it, that didn't work with the timeline of God, then it forced me then to look at it again. I looked at it. I, I, I came up after the rapture. I became a mid-trip. I said, well, okay. Seven years ain't in because all I seen in the book of Revelation was three and a half years. That would make sense for a mid-trip. Right? Okay. All right, let's just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, he was the prince. Well, everything in Daniel is like a domino effect. And if one part of that is off, then all of your prophetic views of the Bible is going to be off. If we make Jesus the Antichrist in the book of Daniel, then that throws everything off. Because people are waiting, asking why there's such a, an anxiousness for somebody to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Because unless that temple is built in Jerusalem, that means the Antichrist ain't got no place to go. So we're waiting. We got Christian people who has disallowed themselves to be the temple of God and hoping that somewhere, somehow, this guy said today, well, when you see that, you can start, you start counting. You know what time it's going to be. You can go and start a prophesying. Well, no, I can prophesy now. You know why I don't prophesy? 
It ain't going to ever happen. In the middle of the week. Well, that, see, but this is what you have to do. And that's how I came up. When I got to the mid and figured that out, it wasn't mid. I went to post. Well, post literally done away with the rapture because it won't be no secret. If it was a rapture, it wasn't going to be a secret. <laughs> right? So it wasn't going to be no secret rapture. If I was a post, if I believed that Jesus Christ is going to wait and get us after the seven years, that wouldn't, that, that's not going to be a surprise because you'd be able to count seven years. But no place in the Bible, when Jesus is prophesying about this end, does he say it's going to be quiet. He said, let's read this real quick. This, this, is going, this is going to be part of my lesson tonight for an example, but since we're here, we might as well just go ahead and play with it a little bit. I don't mean play play, but I mean... <laughs> In, Ma in Matthew chapter 16. And this is one of the scriptures that blew me away. Matthew 16 and matter of fact, in the verse 27, I'll start reading. 16, Matthew 16, 27, 28. He said, for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, number one, we know he's not talking to us. You know how I know he's not talking to us? Because our salvation was never about works. There's what. That's why the Bible talks about you're saved by grace through faith, not of works. Now, that would almost seem like it, it was clashing with what Jesus just said. So he, he's got to be talking to somebody who's going to be judged by their works. Simple as that. The works of the law. He said, and then he goes on to say this. So here's the scripture that got me. When I read this scripture, I had to change a whole lot of things. My eschatology changed. Dearly I say unto you, He's talking to somebody. I know you want to say, verily he say unto me, but as he said, but he said, verily I say unto you. And you got to go back and find out who he's talking to. Who is he talking to? It will tell you who he's talking to now. Verily I say unto you, there will be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I have one question asked the guy. I said, do you know anybody on earth right now that's at least 2,000 years old? Now, why am I saying that? He said, there'll be some of you standing here shall not even taste of death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, in his glory. He spoke to a specific people, telling them, some of you standing here, y'all don't even die before I come. Unless you can find somebody that's still over 2,000 years old right now, then evidently he wasn't talking to us. But I believe that everybody he was talking to that day is dead and gone. And we can't put a rubber band and stretch it beyond where he was talking to. Part of my lesson tonight is, is teaching you, when you read scripture, there's what they call the five W's and the one H. You have to ask yourself this question when you read scripture. When you want to get 
to understand scripture, you got to first of all know who he's talking to. I can't take everything, every quote out the Bible and make it a part of me. He told Abraham, Abraham, take thine only son. That ain't to me. Is that to you? No. Take thine only son. I want you to take him to the mountain and in, in essence kill him. Now we can quote that all we want to, but that wasn't to us. That was to Abraham. Right? That wasn't to you. But now I can learn something from that because in that I'm seeing the operation of God. That's why the Bible says that Abraham seen my day. When did he see Jesus' day? He didn't see his day, see his day, but in revelatory knowledge, he, he saw Jesus' day. He saw a death and a resurrection. He saw a God that would provide himself a sacrifice. So the day he seen was the day that God would provide himself with a sacrifice. And what sacrifice was that? There is no other sacrifice that can be made than the one that Jesus made. So we know what Abraham seen revelatory was the fact that the sacrifice of God was going to be for all humanity. Now, he may not have known it like we know it because they're looking forward and we're looking backwards. The greatest thing we have is the fact that we're looking backwards at what has happened. They were trying to look forward to how it was going to happen, but now we've seen what has happened. We should have a better understanding of this Bible than they had and because they weren't even writing. It was being recorded about them by someone else by the name of Moses. Somebody said, well, how did Moses, matter of fact, my son called me and wanted to ask me that question. You know, how, well, well who, who wrote Genesis? Uh, uh, who wrote that book? Well, see, it really tells you it talks about the beginning, beginning with Moses. Well, when did Moses write the Genesis? Well, you want me to tell you when I think he did it? It's when the Bible says that God set him in the cleft of the mountain and told Moses, I'm going to pass by you, but the only thing you're going to be able to see is my hinder part. That means pass. Because you, when you want to see the present and future, you got to look in the face. He could not, and that's when Moses, even when he went to the mountain, he had the glory of God. He spent 40, 80 days up there, and he came back with the glory of God on him. But he also knew one thing, that glory was not going to last. But he put it on his, put that napkin on his face trying to, Hold the glory, keep it as long as you can because the law does have glory, but the only thing about the glory of the law is faded. That's the reason why if you're in religion, you've got to always keep trying to pump it up. You know, I remember when I was in the Army, they used to give us these brass buckles. Everything on you is brass. The only thing I like about brass, what I hate about brass, you got to keep working on it. <laughs> I don't care, you can shine it up this morning by eating the time and hitting a little oxygen, it's dull. And so you got to keep it shining all the time. So if you would read that scripture right there, mark that in your Bible, and the next time somebody says that he's coming back real soon, ask them where are these guys that he was talking to here? Do you know where they're at? Because I don't, I, don't I don't believe anybody here is over. I don't even believe there's anybody living right now is 200 years old. That no, 2,000. And it would have to be unless Jesus was lying. And I don't believe he can lie. But that's just one of the scriptures that really got me. Uh, looking, because if, if there was some standing there that wasn't going to see death, it means that he had to come back in their lifetime.
Before what? Well then, well, then, well, then Jesus did not tell the truth then. You're calling Jesus a liar. And we did have one to get up one day and said that. said, the apostles thought, what did they say? The apostles thought that Jesus was going to come back in their lifetime, but they were wrong. I asked him this question, that if he was wrong on that thought about when he's going to come back, how can I be sure he's right about I need to be baptized in his name? If I find one place in there where he's wrong, then how can I believe anything else in his word? Okay? It, it, you know, it, there is... Man. No, he wasn't just talking to his disciples. He was talking to a whole group of people. He was talking to everybody in that whole group that was listening to him because he was doing, going about teaching. This is like his... Discourse, all of that discourse. He's telling these people. And, and why would he be telling me, telling them something they ain't going to even experience? Why would he be telling them, don't let your fight be in the wintertime? Pray that it don't be on the Sabbath day. I could care less what it's on the Sabbath day, could you? What day is that? What has the Sabbath day got to do with me? Nothing. Not one thing. Huh? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't just to his disciples. It was to all of Israel. These, everything that the prophets prophesied about in the Old Covenant had to be fulfilled in Jesus. And he gave him a break. He gave him a time, a break. He gave him 30-some years to get it together. Just like he did when he bought him out of Egypt. He gave him 40 years to get to the promised land. Not, and it was really just a 10, 11-day journey, but they could not First thing God wants is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The greatest thing he wanted to build on them was a trust and faith, which they never got. They never could because the first thing they done when they came out of Egypt, they wanted to know what did they need to do instead of how should they believe. Now, strange to me is that they will ask God, what do we need to do? And if you go back, what did you do to get out of Egypt? You didn't do anything. God was doing everything. Then he told you, just put the blood on the doorpost, eat the lamb. That was it. And you had faith enough to do that, and that faith, the lamb and his blood, brought you through the Red Sea. And then you get over on the other side, because you have an Egyptian mentality and been to Egyptian uh, Sunday school, now you want to build him a golden calf, <laughs> which he never asked for. But yet, Again, rightly dividing the word is more than just trying to rightly divide whether or not it was in the Old or New Testament because really this is one book. The Bible means the book. So it's really one book. It's a matter of trying to make this book come together, put the dots together, realize what the purpose of God is and the process of God. What is the purpose of God? What was his purpose? His purpose was that he wanted to have more sons. He didn't come to give you better religion. He wanted a son. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He turned around and said again, the purpose of God is that he would have more sons. But he can't have sons unless he become a son because you got to produce after your own kind. You couldn't be a son of God until God made himself a body so that that body can be a seed for you to become what he had his purpose for you, a son of God. That's why the Bible said, we are the son of God, why? Because we are led by the spirit of God. They that are sons of God, they're led by the spirit of God. So again, 
A lot of these things that we are wrestling with is the fact is that until you believe that Jesus finished what he done, then you're still thinking he's working on something else. He ain't working on no mansion up in heaven somewhere. You are his mansion. He said, I'm going to come and make my abode, my mansion with you. It's not out there. That same word in John. Abode, it's the same word where it says, in my father's house there are many mansions. You look the word up in the Greek. I wish I could tell you the number right off, but if you looked it up, it only means one thing. Mansion only means abode. And they could have translated it again. They could have translated abode as well as mansion. But most people still have this idea about heaven. We can't wait to get there because I'm going to have my mansion and my catfish pond in the back. I'm going to have my deck so I can catch catfish for breakfast. Has nothing to do with it. Nothing. But anyway, that's just Brother Wilson. That's right. Well, but see, again, again if, if you have presupposed by the teaching that we've had in the past that Jesus, one of these days, is going to come back, then that scripture right there, you're right. It would not make sense to him because he couldn't have been right. He had to be confused on that one because, because they're waiting, again, they're waiting just like those same religious Jews was waiting for their Messiah to come. Messiah was there. It wasn't that they didn't believe Jesus was coming, but what they had a hard time believing that he was there. And he, here he is, he's saying, if you don't believe that I am he, you're going to die in your sin. Guess what? They didn't believe he was he. They didn't believe it. And the more and more, that's the reason why he gave them so many signs. That's the reason why in, in Jeremiah, uh, 31, 33, I think it is, where he says, uh, with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. And guess what? They still won't believe. What more could he do? He came with signs and wonders, just like in Egypt, they seen all the signs. One thing about Jewish people, they needed signs. They needed to see a sign. They needed a sign. He done, that's the reason why he had to convince them in Egypt that he was God. Why did he convince them? Signs and wonders. He get in the new covenant. He come, what does he do? Signs and wonders. They even had to testify. We have never seen it on this fashion before. We've never seen it like this before. He came and showed them all kind of signs. I hear even people today talking about, boy, if I could just see a miracle, I'd believe. I'm going to tell you what, you wouldn't believe no more than they believe. They seen the Red Sea open up. <laughs> they seen blood turn to uh, water turn to blood. They seen all kind of stuff. Did it help their faith? No. Because your faith is really going to be when you get in contact with faith, and that's him. Unless you really have Jesus, all the miracles, all the signs and wonders does not make you believe him. We don't need a sign. That's why the Bible, he said to them, you are an adulterous generation because of what? You seeketh after signs. We're not seeking after signs. I'm not looking for a sign. I've got the testimony that he's here. When I spoke in tongues, you know what it told me? Jesus done showed up. <laughs> huh? That's what it told me. Because why would they have you down there praying, you know, when I, when I came to court? They didn't have to do that when the church first started, but we kind of have to do a lot of things today they didn't do then. You know, Jesus, 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 Jesus. What did you call on Jesus if you don't believe you're going to get Jesus? Does that make sense? Then you'll call Jesus, 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 Jesus. And then you get the Holy Ghost. You say, man, I got the Holy Ghost, but now I'm waiting on Jesus to come. <laughs> he can't do no more now than he's already done in you now. No. 
No. Uh, uh, the whole thing is this. Well, he's coming back basically because the devil got too rough on the church. Okay? After Jesus' word telling you that he's given you all this power, great is he that's in you, all the stuff he told you that you had, but he's got to come back and put down the insurrection of the devil because the devil got too bad. It's going to get so bad that the church has got to get out of here so God can destroy the world. And then that becomes kind of funny because John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. Then I, I get to thinking, because in our minds is that we, I think most people look at this life as being so terrible because we have never really w woke up with a thankful heart. On our worst day, we are living better than most people are on their best day. We've never woke, w awakened to the fact how good God really is and what he really came to do in us. He came to do in each individual. See, we're looking for a corporate thing in which, you know, uh, we don't have to believe God, but he's going to rapture us out of here. We ain't really got faith in God, but he, he got to get us out of here. See, that already kind of bothers me because if you got enough faith to believe one day that God's going to come get you, why can't you believe today that he's already here in you working what he said he's going to work? You're going to tell me you got more faith to fly through the skies, you say, but you ain't got enough faith to keep your feet on the ground and get healed, get delivered, find the peace of God. We, we go through all kind of hell for no reason, uh, no reason, all because we don't believe he's the prince of peace. How can you have Jesus, who is the prince of peace, and you don't have none? Then if you ask somebody, what does salvation mean? What does salvation mean? What is salvation? Because most people's idea of salvation it's not about what God came and gave you, but it's what you're going to get because you are saved later on. God, thank God, he saved me from a devil's hell. There ain't no such thing as a devil's hell because the devil don't own nothing. He never owned nothing on earth. And if he owned hell, it's busted up too. Because the Bible says Jesus Christ came and conquered death, hell, and the grave. So if he conquered it, the devil cannot own it. Can he? I mean, question we got to ask ourselves. It's not, like I said, I'm not, I'm not trying to, I, I got to tone myself down so I won't sound so rough, but I get so sick and tired of, of people going to make this stuff right and you can't even find scriptures for us. Mm, that's a good one too. That's another good one. And they say, even they that pierce him shall look upon him. Okay, again. <clears throat> that was about 2,000, over oh, 2,000 years ago. Did, did any of y'all see him get pierced? Do y'all know anybody that's seen him get pierced? Oh, but then we use that rubber band. But well, he's not really talking literally. <laughs> it's funny how when he tells you stuff, they're going to look upon him. They're going to mourn for him as one who has lost the only begotten son. They're going to cry. They're going to weep. Why? Because they pierced him. Man. Anyway, I, I don't want to really get on that tonight, but y'all got me. Oh! Okay, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> Y'all kept me going too long. But in the Christian, though, something simple. Don't make it. Hmm? One more. Okay. Uh-huh. 
Okay, now see, here's the thing. Now, the old covenant, they didn't have God on the inside. In the old covenant, it's about seeking God. Because it always seemed like God was eluded. They'd had to seek him because he wasn't resident in them. There's certain things they had to do, just like in the tabernacle of Moses. Everybody didn't even see the glory of God. A lot of people, didn't, they lived their whole life and never even went into the presence of God. It become a different covenant for us. We're not seekers. Now we are discovering what God has given us. So it's not about me seeking. It's about me more or less discovering God. Now I think sometimes we, we want to take that, seek the Lord. Well, you seek something that you don't have. You try to find something that you don't have. But once you have been baptized into Christ and you have put Christ on, you're not really having to seek him now. Now you need to discover what you got. How do you know what you got until you discover what you got? It's like God putting Adam in the Garden of Eden. He didn't have to seek anything in the garden. He just needed to discover what God had placed in the garden for him. Same thing now. God has put you in his garden. You're in his garden. He's making a garden in you. What do you need to do? I need to discover. I need to discover healing. I need to, I, I'm not seeking God for healing because when he came, he is a healer. I need to discover healing. I need to discover peace. I need to discover all the things he said is mine. I need to discover that because it's not yours until you discover it. Like the promised land. He can give you the promised land, but you can look from the other side and say, yeah, I got the promised land. Praise God. But until you step into the promised land and discover what's in the promised land, you still don't have the promised land. Right? The Holy Ghost didn't automatically put you anywhere, but it allowed you, gave you access to things that you really are not taking advantage of. If you go back, John 3 says, man born of water and spirit. If you're going to see the kingdom, he's got to be born of water and spirit. If you're going to enter into the kingdom, you've got to be born of water and spirit, right? So the Holy Ghost really becomes your entryway to discover all the things that God has for you. The Holy Ghost is you discovering what God has. If he made you a promise, none of those promises, all them promises are true, but until you discover them, they're not true to you. I can know God is a healer, but unless I discover God's a healer, I'm just saying he's, I know he can heal. I know he can. I know water's wet too. But when I get healed by him, when I discover healing in him, then I have discovered the healer. All right? I know now. I'm not just saying he can because I read it in the book. God was healing before they had the Bible. Abraham went down into Egypt. They got a healing in Egypt, and he didn't quote a scripture. So he's always been a healer. But you have to discover that in your own life. It's not about what other people say. It's not about what you can see the Bible says. But what have you seen been revealed to you? Because revelation comes by faith. And faith is built off of revelation. You can't know Jesus without a revelation. He's more than a five-letter word. He's more than a man that died on the cross. He's more than a man that was buried and rose again. He's more than that. But have you discovered that yet? Otherwise, on time you're getting excited, it's Easter. But you got to heal it in you. Right. Every, everything, everything that you need in this life. Yeah. And, see, and see, but the thing about it, our image has been marred. Because man thought that God was like him, like the Jews thought. They thought God was like them. And all the time God was trying to make them like him. And we got the same problem today is that we're still trying to be like others 
and God is trying to create in you and make you like him. You can be like anybody you want to be like, but it don't mean like you like, that you're like Christ, okay? Religion, you can be whatever you want to call yourself, but it doesn't mean you're like Christ because she said that, okay? We try, to, we try to mar the image of God by trying to dissect it into denominational teachings, and if you do this, then that means you're a good Christian. Well, the only good Christian is one who is created in his image and likeness. Whatever he is, that's what you are, Okay? Christianity is, is the process of being Christ-like, but we made Christianity more of a religion than we did anything else because we put it in the same boat. We got uh, Islam, Christianity, Buddhism. We make, and, and, and God never came to establish a religion. Jesus didn't come to establish a religion. He came to establish a relationship like he had in the beginning when he walked with Adam. All right? Well, are you a Christian? Well, they were called Christian, but they, am I a Christian? Yes. I'm, I'm, I operate in Christianity. But more than that is that I want to be like him because we have made Christianity of being a Christian like generic. All you got to do is buy a Bible, wear a cross, and call yourself a Christian. But Christianity is just like the Jews. It's just like, all Israelites was not Israelite because it was born into the nation. It was only those that considered Israelites whose heart had been circumcised by the Spirit. So same thing now is that we may call ourselves a Christian, but unless my heart has been circumcised by his Spirit, I'm really not like him. Do we know what he's like? Apart from religion. Anyway, come back next week. Man, y'all made me...